Going ahead. Praise the Lord for that. It's very good news because we've already ripped everything apart. So there was, there was kind of no going back anyway. That's great. Uh, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, as we gather together this morning, we do so as your children. And we gather knowing that you are a good God and a powerful God and a loving God and a God who keeps his promises day after day after day. Your promise to watch over us. Your promise to protect us. Your promise to forgive us every time we call upon you. Your promise to answer us when we pray. So God, as we gather now, we gather together as your children. Lord, I pray that you give to us peace and comfort and hope and faith and strength as we gather in your name. Amen. We are not going to receive our offering today by passing the plate around. It's just at the back. So if you brought an offering and you want to um, share in that way in our service, uh, the plates are just back there. And when we get to communion, I'll just kind of talk us through that, uh, but we'll still be celebrating communion uh, this morning. If you're just joining us for the first time, or if you forget where we were last week, we are working our way through the book of Esther. We are now on chapter 8. Last week in chapter 7, the queen had her second feast, invited King Ahasuerus and Haman, and it's at that feast where she announced that she was in fact a Jew, and she pleaded for the life of all the other Jews. Uh, The king went outside uh, to kind of collect his thoughts. He was quite angry at what was happening. Uh, Meanwhile, Haman was pleading for his life to the queen. He topples over, falling onto the couch where she is, just as the king comes back in. The king assumes that he's making a move on his queen and immediately has Haman executed. And that's where chapter 7 ends. I'll just read those closing words for you. It says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Remember that? Haman had built these gallows 75 feet high in his own backyard, and that's exactly where he gets killed. This is a huge win, right? Everything has been going Esther and Mordecai's way. She reveals that she's a Jew, the enemy of the Jews gets killed, and all things are going well. And it doesn't stop there. Chapter 8 starts with these words. On that day, the same day that Haman is killed, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. It was common practice if you were a traitor of the king, uh, everything that you owned would then become property of the kings. In this case, which was unusual, the king actually bestows it to his queen Esther, who he's just kind of had this renewed love for as all this uh, has unfolded. So the uh, queen tells uh, the king who she is and also the connection between her and Mordecai, that her and Mordecai are in fact uh, cousins. And so it says this right after that. If we go to the next slide. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her, that they were in fact cousins. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So things are going incredibly well now for Mordecai as well. He was celebrated uh, just a night ago for rescuing the king, which had happened five years earlier. And now everything that belonged to the enemy of the Jews, Haman, has been given to Mordecai. It's pretty good times, isn't it? All of a sudden, he's second in control in all of Persia. He's got all the, the house, the wealth that Haman had collected for himself. And we know that he was an incredibly wealthy man. And so things are just turning up roses for Mordecai as well, which is great. And then this is kind of nice. It warms your heart a bit that after Mordecai has raised his cousin Esther, once her parents had died, he's the one who raised her up, providing for her. And now she's able to provide for him. She gives to him the house of Haman that was gifted to her. Listen, I've got this palace I'm living in. I don't need that guest house or that vacation property. You take this, Haman and uh, Mordecai. So now everything has gone well for Mordecai. But there's still a problem. Can anyone think of what the problem is? the decree against the Jews. The genocide still exists. So Esther's now been saved and Mordecai's safe and their enemy has been killed, but this decree has gone out months earlier issuing a genocide against all the Jews. And so on this set day, all of them are going to be wiped out. That has not changed yet. And so the king, uh, queen and Mordecai are waiting. Like, is the king going to do something about this or not? And meanwhile, all of the Jews are living in fear. They're still waiting. They're still waiting. I mean, Haman's been killed, but what about us? What's going to happen to us? And so the Jews for months are living in this fear. 
church, it reminds me a lot of our world right now. People are living in fear. I imagine a lot of you are doing pretty well, but how many of you went to the grocery store and then got a little bit freaked out? Hey, you're like, what on earth? I went to save on and the security guard was guarding the toilet paper. It's like, what? I didn't, need, I didn't need toilet paper, but I was like, what is that guy doing here? And the, the staff member was talking to him, you stay here and make sure. It's like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. When you're turning to two-ply toilet paper for comfort and peace, there's trouble in the world. If you're experiencing that fear, if you're experiencing panic, that I'd encourage you to turn off the news and turn off your phone, close the laptop, turn off your radio, and open up God's Word. And just read about his faithfulness. Page after page after page of God protecting his people. We see that here in Esther. We see that through the whole scriptures. That God is still God. That God is still in control. That he's still watching over us. That he still has power over all things. Over all sicknesses. Over all disease. He has the power even to raise the dead. And that we have nothing to be afraid of. There those Jews are living in fear. Esther and Mordecai have been waiting for the king to do something, but he hasn't. And months pass between verse 2 and verse 3. Uh, two months go by, actually, if you look at all the dates and how they line up. And they're waiting, 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 but nothing happens. So now Esther will go back to the king. And it's interesting to note that she does so risking her life again. Remember before, she didn't want to go talk to the king because she didn't have an invitation. She said, if I go and he doesn't extend the golden scepter to me, I'll be killed. This time, no one needs to prod her to go to the king. She's had a change of heart. Let me just read this for you. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he'd devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, if it please the king... And if I found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, look at the way she just kind of presents her request, right? Four times she kind of says, it's up to you. If it sounds good to you, if it's pleasing to you, king, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in the provinces of the king. Then listen to these words. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? She's had this big change of heart. Remember earlier she said basically, if you all die, that's okay with me. I need to make sure I live. I'm not going to go to the king. It's too risky, too dangerous. I need to make sure that I survive. And Mordecai really had to pressure her to go. Now she's had a change of heart. She's going to the king on her own. She risks her life. She pleads with him, and he extends once again the golden scepter to her, which means she's found favor and can present her request to him there. As she pleads for her people, as she says these words, how can I bear to see the destruction of my people? It makes me wonder, what about us? As you read how Esther responded, her people lived in fear. What about your people? How is your family doing? How are your neighbors doing? How are your co-workers doing? Are they living in a fear similar to what the Jews were living in? Are you pleading to God on their behalf? God, please watch over my family. Please watch over my neighbors. Please watch over my coworkers. Are we pleading on behalf of those people? Because the reality is there's a much bigger fear. I know everyone's concerned about COVID-19 or coronavirus or whatever name you're calling it. Everyone's concerned about that. But there's a much greater fear, or there should be. Because the Bible tells us there's two places people will go when they die. There's heaven and there's hell. And I probably don't spend enough time talking about hell. I don't pound the pulpit loudly enough or shout at you or lean over and my face doesn't turn red when I speak. We don't talk enough about hell. But the reality is the Bible says there's two places. Everyone's going to go there. That should cause some fear and concern. That should cause some pleading on our behalf for the lives of those around us who don't know Jesus yet. That should motivate us to appeal to God on their behalf again and again and again. I was with someone yesterday at the manor. They are nearing the end of their life. um, And they were unresponsive. And so I was just sharing with the family. The great news of the gospel is... That the way to heaven isn't how much we've done, 
It isn't how much we've amassed. It isn't how smart we are. It isn't our good works, but it's all Jesus. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Those are such great words of promise for us. And as people around us live in fear, we should also be alerting them to the greater fear and the greater promise that God has provided a way for them. Look at how the king responds to Esther and Mordecai. This is the king speaking. Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Let me translate this for you, what the king says here. I'm sorry, I can't help you. That's what he says to them. I'm sorry, but I can't help you because whatever's been decreed by the king cannot be changed. So there's this genocide issued against your people. I'm sorry. There's actually nothing I can do about it. He lists off the things I have done. You know, I did have Haman killed, okay? And so that's good news. And uh, now, he, now he can't do what he wanted to do. But that decree, there's nothing I can do about it. How embarrassing is that for this king? Three times he's told Queen Esther, ask anything you want, right? You remember these words? Up to half the kingdom and it shall be yours. Give me your wish. Give me your request. I'm in a given mood. I'll give you whatever you want. And she says, this is what I want. He says, oh, man. I didn't, I didn't think you were going to ask for that. I can't do that. That's the one thing I can't do. Esther, ask me for anything else and I'll do it for you. Up to half of my kingdom. He does give them this hope. Here's my ring. Write whatever you want to write. You can issue any decree you want. Here this king is, again, not asking a lot of questions, right? You want to make a decree? Go ahead. Decree anything you want, anything you come up with. So Mordecai and Esther get together and they summon the king's scribes. It says this, talking about Mordecai. He wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud. This is uh, the equivalent of FedEx, right? Same day express. Saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. You know what I love in here? There's a lot of good things in here, but what I love in here is that Mordecai and Esther don't say, well, somebody should do something. King, this is your job. They don't stand at the king's door and keep banging, you need to do something. They don't get a bunch of cardboard and write signs on it protesting against the king. And they don't look around and say, well, where are all the leaders here? Someone has to do something. They just do it. Mordecai and Esther right away get all the scribes together and say, this is what we're doing. It's urgent. Get the best horses. Get the king's horses. We're sending this out today because this is so significant for us. Somebody should do something. The next time I hear someone say those words, I'm going to say, praise the Lord. God has brought you here for such a time as this. You do it. Aren't we good as people at saying somebody should? We wag our fingers and somebody should as much as we want. But the reality is if God's put that on your heart and that on your mind, then you're the someone. You're the somebody and God's brought it to your attention. Mordecai writes this new decree with full authority, and it's, it echoes the first decree that went out. It's very similar, but it gives the Jews a few things that they can do. First of all, on that day of genocide that's been declared against them, they can gather together, they can defend their lives, and they can plunder from everyone who attacks them. They can gather together. So they, can, they can rally. Right before, they just had to, like, take it. They said to let themselves be killed. Now the decree says, no, 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 you get yourselves together, you get your weapons together, and then this isn't an issue to go kill whoever they want, but if someone attacks you, you can defend your lives. And you can wipe out not only the people who attack you, but you can also then go to their houses and kill their families as well. This notice was then published everywhere. The first decree was published. This day we're killing the Jews. Now this notice goes up beside it. Just so you know, the Jews are going to be armed. And if they kill you, they're going to come kill your, your wife and children as well. And I think a lot of people probably read that notice and say, well, I'm not going to go. I don't think I'm going to go kill the Jews today. 
I don't really feel up to it. It feels a little risky to me. It feels a little dangerous to me. The other change that is existent here is in the first decree issuing the genocide against the Jews, people couldn't take any plunder. There was no benefit to them except for killing the Jews. They couldn't take any plunder because Haman needed that money to pay the king. Remember, he was going to pay the king 10,000 talents for the privilege of killing the Jews. Now, the Jews are able to plunder from the people that they kill. Listen to this next part. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. This is everything that Haman wanted, isn't it? This is everything Haman had been clinging to. Remember, he said, I've got everything. But then when he had a chance to request something else, he said, I want to wear the king's robes and I want to ride the king's horse and I want someone to show to it how great I am so people are going to come out and praise me. Everything gets taken away from Haman and Mordecai gets it all. He puts on his royal robes, goes out, and everyone applauds and celebrates him. says this, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. They've been living under this cloud of fear and despair. The Jews had, just listen to those words again, light. The clouds had parted, the rays of sun were shining through. Suddenly there was hope again, joy again, light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. They were getting ready to die, right? This genocide's coming. Now this new decree comes out and they are celebrating and they say, what are we going to do? We're going to eat and take a day off, right? I mean, doesn't that just sound good? What a reversal of fortunes for them. We are celebrating. And it says that people all over the place became Jews. Some of those people undoubtedly became Jews because it seemed like a good move to make. Second in command is a Jew. The queen is a Jew. I'm hopping on the Jew train right now because everything is going well for these guys. But some of them, I believe, most likely said, look at what God's doing for these people. The God of the Jews is doing something and I'm going to put my trust, my hope in him as well. Church, right now, you know this, but our world is in panic. And you know what they need more than toilet paper? Jesus. They need Jesus. Our world needs to know this Jesus who brings comfort and peace and hope and light and gladness and joy. It's interesting as this virus first started to spread, the first thing to disappear off the shelves was what? Toilet paper. The first thing to go was toilet paper. You know what toilet paper does to protect you? Nothing. It does nothing at all, but people who are afraid and in panic do irrational things. I need 150 rolls of toilet paper. You know what worries me is what they weren't buying was hand soap. That's a lot of wiping without a lot of washing. That should be our biggest fear, really. It's interesting, as they reach for the toilet paper just because they're afraid, what they really need is soap and hand sanitizer. People right now in our world are living in fear, and what they really need to be reaching for is Jesus. Because Jesus has power. Jesus has power over all things, we're told. Should Christians still wash their hands? Absolutely. Can Christians still do social distance things? Look at how well these people are spread out, except the McMasters. You guys are in real danger of each other right now. Can Christians do that? Of course we can. Can Christians uh, keep some distance from people who have uh, immune systems that are compromised? Absolutely. Of course we should do that. Should we follow all these kind of statements that are coming out from the government? Sure we can do that. Should we be on a cruise right now? Maybe not, right? Like maybe that's just a bad move to make. I'm not going to judge if you're cruising right now. We can do all those things. But we can do them not because we're terrified, not because we're in fear, but because we're God's people and we're following the rules of our land and we're trusting that God is going to keep us safe. You know what would be even greater is if today when you went home, you phoned your neighbors. Said, hey, are you guys okay? I'm going to the store anyway. Do you need something? We got food in the freezer. Do you need some food right now? Can I, is there something I can do to help you out or encourage you? Because nobody knows you're here, church. Everyone more than ever right now has their blinds closed and they're in total lockdown mode. So what you do after church will actually be more significant in some ways than what you do now. 
as you go out and worship God, as you're the hands and feet of Jesus, as you go out and check in with those people, your people, I mean, that'll be a big statement about your faith and trust in God and your love for the people around us. If you want to bring some light and gladness and joy to the world, then you need to show them the love and care and concern of Jesus. The Bible says that we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us. Man, what an opportunity we have right now. Man, how come you're so calm? Well, because I know Jesus. And these are the things he's done, and these are the things he's doing, and I know his perfect love, and his love drives out fear because I know that nothing is going to separate me from that love. No power, no virus, no sickness, no, no nothing. There's nothing that will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that you're here this morning, but you're more powerful witness than what you do right now will be what you do as you go home how you demonstrate love and care and concern to the people around you. Not by saying someone should, but by actually going. So as you go, may you bring light and hope and gladness as you point them to the one who lived and died and rose again for us and who is God over all yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are God over all. We give you thanks that knowing you brings comfort and peace. Jesus, that you gave peace not like the world has it, but you gave a lasting, everlasting peace. God, help us to cling to that in times of fear and worry and concern. And God, we pray for those people who are stockpiling things to try and profit off of them. Lord, we pray that they would have a change of heart. Lord, we pray for those people who are sick, that you would bring them healing as the great physician. Lord, we pray for all doctors and nurses and care workers, that you would grant them safety. Lord, we pray for all those people who might be out of work or whose businesses are suffering right now, that you would be the God who provides for them and that we'd provide as your hands and feet for those people. Lord, we pray for all people who have depleted or compromised immune systems. We ask that you just put a hedge of protection around them. Lord, I pray that you'd bring us peace and calm. That you'd help us to see the clouds break. That we would be that light. That light of care and compassion and love that reaches out to those around us. Lord, for whatever else is on our hearts and minds today, we commit all those things to you. Trusting in your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us.